Good morning. Well, it's wonderful to be back here. I was here a year before September. Who was at Tabernacle? We've got a few people. And we met some of your church family then. And uh, we didn't have long because uh, me and my sister were trying to get out of Britain during COVID. Now, that was fun. And we actually had to spend two weeks in Croatia just to get into your country. This time was a lot easier. Praise the Lord. So I um, work with Streams Ministries International, which was founded by uh, John Paul Jackson. Well, I'm sure some of you have heard of John Paul. And I know that Rob and Katie kind of host the, the Streams courses here and teach some of those courses. And I'm also a Streams teacher, but I've been with uh, Streams over 20 years. And during those years, I'm going to be speaking about some of the stuff that God has unfolded. So to date, I am the director of Streams Creative House, which is one area of Streams. It's very multifaceted. But the heart and the vision of Streams and Streams Creative House is to equip God's people and to help them to hear from God, to understand that God has a whole plethora of creative conversations. But if we don't understand what he's saying, then we're going to miss it. We don't know what he's trying to tell us. And we can really miss out on that. So it's our heart and our passion at Streams to kind of go wherever God sends us and to bring that message. And I love what Jeffrey said that I, that I find that deeply honoring that he came to Scotland and he, he saw a childlike faith modeled. Because the one thing that the Lord has done for me and lots of my team that I work with, I never work alone, is that he has restored to us a childlikeness. And that we can come before the Lord with joy and with freedom and abandon and worship. And that we can find some really deep reservoirs of the Holy Spirit. And that's, our, that's the thing we love the most. So I want to talk to you this morning. I specifically felt to bring a message on the house of David, which would also include the tabernacle of David and basically the whole time frame. What was going on during the reign of David and what does it actually mean for us today? There are so many important keys in the house of David that would help us understand how we're supposed to reach a modern culture. About nine years ago, the Lord gave me a vision. I was just praying one day and the Lord showed me this vision of a map and the map was kind of stretched out across the globe, kind of this way, slightly kind of horizontal. And as I looked at the globe kind of stretching out, little lights began to appear and then they multiplied and they multiplied and they multiplied, boom, and the vision was gone. A very simple vision, but it felt very profound. And I said to the Lord, so what are you trying to show me? What do I need to understand from this vision? And what he said to me is, at the time, I'll just give you a little backdrop. At the time, I was doing a lot of leading evangelistic teams in our nation. We were going into spiritual fairs and bars and streets, and we were taking the kind of revelatory gifting and the prophetic gifting, and we were using that to help people understand what God was saying to them, people who didn't know God. We were using creativity in certain ways, but these were the early days. And I felt the Lord say to me, this vision is revealing that my people are already strategically positioned. And I knew the Lord was talking about a next great wave of the harvest because we were in a massive wave of evangelism in our little nation. But suddenly that wave felt quite small compared to what was about to rise. It wasn't a wave that the Lord wanted to rise and crash like one too many revival waves. It was a wave that the Lord was really talking about. I, I felt like it was the end times harvest. But the Lord was saying, my people are already strategically positioned to carry this out. So I got all excited because we were always short of team for the amount of hunger out there. And I said, so Lord, where are they? I thought, they're going to be hiding in the church cupboard because we've, you know, we've anyone about anyone want to join the team? Anyone want to join the team? And, you know, you would have big evangelistic teams, but let's face it, it's never enough to reach all the people. And so I thought God was about to add to our numbers. 
but this is what he said to me. He said, they are already strategically positioned, but they are in their workplaces and they will need some activation. And what that vision triggered for me was an understanding that for us to recognize, to steward and maintain the great wave of harvest revival that's coming, we need to prepare. It's not one sermon. It's not one course. We need to prepare our hearts because sometimes the Lord moves and we dismiss it. You're very quiet for Americans. You're at, it really, this is quite daunting. You're acting like British people now, which I'm used to. Uh, you know, we never get, you know, when I go to, when I'm teaching in Britain, you never get a preach it sister. I love that. I love that. I do. I love that. And then when I come to America, everybody goes, and the tumbleweed rolls through the room. Just be yourselves. You're very encouraging, lovely vocal people. Thank you. Thank you. That's, I feel so much better now. So I had a flashback, I thought, am I in Britain or? No, still in America, it's all good. I love, love coming to America. God bless America, Carrie, absolutely. Frank and Caroline came with me from Scotland. We are all leaders of Streams Creative House along with Katie and Rob Mazza and Andrea Berether. So it's a joy for us all to be together. And you know, we've been talking about this in the Limitless course. I think it's hilarious that your annual conference is called Limitless because this course I wrote nine years ago, that is exactly the name gave me for the course. So there's a something going on here. But the Lord began, you know, Limitless is full of this message and it's grown over the years. And the Lord was saying, you know, start to, you know, we're, there's going to be lots of great believers around the globe who will contribute to this preparation and this restoration. But we all just have to do the peace that God has given us. And God said to me, Charity, with the journey that you have had, I want you to start to prepare the body of Christ wherever I send you. And you'll meet others who are doing the same thing. But the idea is that God is not going to move how we think he's going to move. And so many times we look at revivals of old and we're waiting for that. And then when he starts to move at the beginning of a something, we're like, oh no, that's a bit weird and that's a bit strange. We don't do that in our church. And we can dismiss the first seeds of revival. And if we won't receive them and nurture them, he will take them somewhere else. And I know you're a church that's contending for this. I know you're a church that's hungry. I have seen the heart of the leadership. I have seen the courage just through discernment on the hearts of the leadership of this church. And so the Lord said, bring this message because it will land on good soil here. Hallelujah. Now the time, that's better. <laughs> you're much more like yourselves now. I'm feeling it, I'm feeling it. You went, yeah, it feels good. So why is the house of David important? Well. John Thomas, who leads streams, brings a great message at the moment about the house of Saul versus the house of David. And what he said is this church of the future, this is us, us now and where we're going, that we don't want to be like the house of Saul. Saul cared more about what the people thought than what God thought. And it caused his demise. So Saul begins to demise. And as he begins to demise, God appoints a young shepherd boy who's hiding in obscurity and singing to the sheep. And he comes and he appoints him and he says, you will be the next king of Israel. And we know that it takes a long time for that to happen. But the rise of David begins as the demise of Saul is happening as well. And why was David different to Saul? What did he prove that we need to understand today? David put God first. He didn't bend to the pressure of the people. He was all out for what God wanted. And he had to make big sacrifices to, to prove that and to steward that. Now, I want, to, I want to take you into Amos. And Amos was a prophet. And he had a really great job because Israel was being super, super naughty at the time. And Amos gets the job of telling them all off. I tell who wants that job I do not. But he was called by God, I love the Bible said, to sift the house of Israel. Like grain through a sieve, 
That sounds really painful, quite frankly. But then Amos says, you know, you guys are really off track and you need to get your act together. And there's, that's my nice version of it. But he does bring hope. And in Amos, he brings hope and he speaks of a future time when God will restore, when God will raise up rather a new kingdom and it will be the kingdom of the Messiah. And in that, Amos gives a prophecy and it's interesting what he says. Amos 9, 11. Amos speaks about the tabernacle of David and he says it has fallen down and it needs rebuilt and restored, which is an interesting thing. Why does it need rebuilt and restored? Now we jump to Acts, Acts 15, 16 to 17, and we find ourselves at the beginning of the new church. Jesus has left the earth, he's hung on the cross, he's paid the cost, and now we're at the beginning of the forming of the new church, which we are today. And the Jerusalem council is gathered together and they are there to discuss, do we allow the Gentiles to be part of this new church? What is God saying? And James stands up and he addresses the council and he basically cites Amos's prophecy. And it's very key what he says. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up. Why? It says here, so, and it's a big so, so that the rest of mankind may seek for God. Even all the Gentiles called by my name. Okay, that's end time harvest stuff. And the more I've studied the tabernacle of David or the house of David, the time frame of David, the more I've realized that we have not restored all that's in the tabernacle of David. Sometimes we think we do. I've noticed through traveling fairly extensively in this calling that sometimes we give lip service to it, but we're not actually embracing it. And according to... What James is saying here and what Amos has told us that the whole point of the restoration of the tabernacle of David is so that all of humanity will turn their face towards God. It's a big so, isn't it? Come on, someone say preach it, sister. Because thank you, because this is a really good point right here. Now, these prophecies we know pointed towards the kingdom of the Messiah. And we know that that peace has been fulfilled, that Jesus came, that he walked the earth, that he hung on the cross, and that he paid an amazing cost for the freedom that we can have today, the access to the presence of the Lord. But there was so much more in this divinic restoration. Today, we mainly associate the tabernacle of David with prayer and worship. And we've done a good job of that. And that is absolutely a key part of the restoration of the tabernacle of David. But it modeled so much more, so much more. To restore the tabernacle of David in this era, we have to restore the elements of the house of David. We have to look at what was going on in the time of David and we need to connect the dots. You know, we talk so much today about that vision I saw. I saw that vision of our need to touch culture and that God's people were out there in every area of culture in their workplaces. They were positioned, strategically positioned to move, but they were going to need some equipping. And the, the word that the Lord gave me was activation. To activate means something's not happening. There needs to be an action and at the moment there isn't. That was the essence of the vision. Fast forward nine years and this topic of workplace evangelism is becoming much more common, isn't it? Much more common, thank God, because I've been feeling it for nine years. It's like, we've got to do something. We often feel in our, and I'm talking about the wide spectrum of the church, I meet so many Christians who feel like they're doing church and doing work. 
And the, the bridge in between is a really difficult one to cross. And I believe what God is really blowing through the church right now is we've got to shift on this one. It's way overdue. It's way over time. And grace has been extended to us that has, it's like I felt the Lord say, I just can't extend the grace on this any longer because I need my people activated to reach a world of people in every sphere of culture that do not know the Lord so that all humanity will turn their face towards God and begin to ask the questions, begin to feel a stirring. Since the time of Jesus, over 2,000 years ago, our entire spectrum of workplace and job titles and job opportunities has massively diversified, massively. And when I say workplace, I would say that it, to me, what you do in your workplace is where you go about the business that God has called you to. You may be a volunteer, you may be with children at home, you may be caring for elderly relatives, you may be a community worker, you may be in paid employment, but you get the, you get the picture. This is not just people with nine to five jobs who get paid a certain salary. We work, we work for the Lord, we work where he has called us and that if God has called you somewhere, it's holy ground. Yeah. It's sacred ground. It's not sacred in here and secular out there. Wherever you go, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit of God. And wherever your feet touch the earth, you make it sacred ground. So when you walk into your workplace or your office or your community or you're at home with your children, you are declaring with your sheer presence that this is holy ground and that you have authority to change something here because that's your calling from God. Today, I, let's take one area and think about how much this has changed. Let's take the area of science. Do you think the whole spectrum of science and jobs within science has changed since Jesus' day? What do you think? just ever so slightly. How many job titles and layers and nuances and researchers and developers and labs and all this kind of stuff have we developed? Now, what about if you apply that to medicine? Have we advanced in medicine? Thank God, just a bit. They don't stick those leachy things on us anymore to suck our blood. Very grateful for that. What about the area of the arts, the entertainment industry and media? What about technology? Do you think that's changed a little bit in two, year, in two years, 2,000 years? It's changed a lot in two years, guys, let's face it. What about the areas of design, engineering, education, architecture, business, commerce, politics, trade, family, community, social services? I could go on and on. The nuances of job titles, of callings have become a lot more niche and a lot more diverse. We are going to need some highly creative ways to reach a full spectrum of people. If we're going to, if we're going to reach this very diverse modern culture, we are going to have to widen the spectrum of ways that we demonstrate the kingdom of God out there. Within the church culture at the moment, we don't mean to, but we're kind of stuck in a very narrow permission spectrum. Evangelism can look like this, this and this. A food bank, absolutely brilliant. Or if we go out and, you know, at Christmas time is a great time for evangelism and people go and share the love of God with all sorts of things. Carol singing, giving gifts, giving money to the poor, all sorts of brilliant things. Now, they are brilliant but they're only part of the spectrum because that doesn't really work for you in the office, does it? And I don't know about your country, but I hear it's the same as us. You can't really preach up a storm in the, in the staff room at lunchtime. In, in the UK, if you did that, you'd be accused of proselytizing and you'd probably get a warning. To bring us, you know, a sobering thought, my husband's a doctor, but he can't pray for anybody in the hospital. He's a children's specialist, hospital doctor, but he can't, even with a dying child, he can't publicly pray with the children or the parents. <clears throat> so we got to find some creative ways to release the Holy Spirit of God that 
we can, it can't be as obvious as it used to be. Sorry, I have a little dry throat. I've done a lot of speaking this weekend. So this is where, this is not going to work. This is where the creative power of God becomes our best friend. You know, the spirit of religion teaches us to think in very linear ways. I'm not talking about the true spirit of religion of the Father God that it's mentioned in the Bible. I'm talking about the spirit of religion that's man-made, that the enemy fuels, that masquerades as God in our churches, in our culture, and that it fools people outside and they think, I don't want to come into that. I don't want to be part of that. That's all rules and regs and they all look really miserable anyway. That is the spirit of religion. Where the spirit of God is released, there should be joy. There should be an awful lot of what we saw starting to go on this morning. And we're going to find out why. See, the spirit of religion aims to con control and restrict because it wants to minimize God's impact upon the earth. If it, if it can keep us all huddled in here and miserable and feeling powerless, we're not going to go out there and carry the power of God to this whole of humanity that have not yet turned its face towards the Lord. We need a radical shift in our thinking as God's church right now. And I don't mean that in a harsh, critical way. I mean that there's so much more available to us. There's so much more on offer. But if we don't know it's there, we don't plug into it. The tabernacle of David and the entire tabernacle pattern of the Bible outlines for us example after example after example of believers reaching culture. Think of the kingdom of Solomon. I'm going to talk about that in the next service. I'm not going to repeat the message. I'm going to, I'm going to add another layer. So if you want to hang about this morning for more, I will be changing up the topic. And we'll be really looking at the impact of the Reformation, the Renaissance, and the biblical Renaissance of the Kingdom of Solomon. There was so much in that for enabling us today. You know, there are more and more ministries beginning to tackle this radical shift that's needed about workplace and equipping and empowering believers in the place that they are called. David, what did David model for us? David is what I call a full spectrum leader. Why? Well, David was the king of Israel, wasn't he? And David was also, therefore, a political leader. But David was also an amazing military strategist. Just think about the territory that David expanded for Israel in his time. Now, David would have been a busy guy. Do you think he would have been busy? A little bit of pressure, a little bit of pressure from the people, people's opinions, people's wants. What about pressure from enemies? You know, David didn't just have enemies that gave him a bad rap on social media. David had the kind of enemies that wanted to come and take your, your hair off at the neck and basically take your kingdom away from you and take no prisoners. David was really up against some scary, scary enemies. What did David do when he got really busy and when he got pressured as he became king? Did he ditch his worship to God? Do you think that the Bible diminishes David's artistry and his worship to God? Remember, he was a musician, he was a poet, he was a creative writer, he wrote new songs, and he put all of that together to seek the Lord. Is there biblical evidence that when he was doing all his really big political stuff, that that got diminished? No. Because there's an entire book of the Bible that is dedicated to David and some of his closest friends that is absolutely devoted to David's creative worship. It's so highlighted that it's one of the most loved and famous books of the Bible. So what David did was, here's how I see it. David recognized that God has a full spectrum character, right? Do you think, let's go to certain points of the I'm a teacher, so I do tend to ask you questions, but it's good because it makes you think. So on the spectrum, do you think that David, that, sorry, that 
that Father God invented leadership. Yes. Do you think we need kings, queens, politicians, and leaders that God invented them and that he, he appointed them? Now let's go down onto the spectrum. Do you think that God created the arts? And what about, do you think that God created something like ballet? Do you think that being called to the whole realm of dance and ballet would be a legitimate calling if it was to reach people in that sphere? And not only to reach people in that sphere, but to demonstrate the power of the beauty of God through movement and to release the glory and anointing of that dancer as they move and demonstrate something of the kingdom of God. But here's what we do today in church. We take this spectrum. So we've got missionaries in there. We've got pastors of churches, leaders of ministries, and we've got, you know, people who work in the education system, the, the medical arena, all these different arenas, and we grade them. And we grade them as some are more spiritual than others. And that's exactly where we're stuck, I believe, in the church today. And I believe that the Lord wants to awaken, revive, refresh us and say, come on. Every single calling for every single one of his children is on the spectrum of the demonstration of the character of God. Who are we to say that one calling is more valuable than the other? And we do. We do it all the time and we grade them from one to 10. Pastor of a church, well, that one's obvious. That's a 10. Ministry leader, that one's obvious. That's a 10. Ballerina, hmm, minus five? If we, no, it's not my grading. I take polls in the classes I teach. And I'd say, you know, in the, amongst the Christians you know, what would you give for somebody who literally feels co the calling of God in their life is to paint, to do it well, and to release through visual art the anointing and power of God? Most Christians would give that a one to two if you're lucky. I'm just going to be brutally honest from years of research. And what the Lord has shown me through over a decade of research in this is the arts and the creativity is just as key to the restoration of the tabernacle of David. Why do we need the restoration? Because so that all mankind will turn their face to God. So if we diminish the spectrum of the character of God, we will diminish our impact out there as the church. And that's exactly what we're struggling with right now. That's exactly why we're seeing whole areas of culture not flooding into our churches. We love our church families. We love the power of God. But so often we feel limited in how we can demonstrate God and how we feel about him to other people. We've got to stop grading the spectrum. So pastors of churches are absolutely valuable and absolutely key, but so is a visual artist. So is a doctor. I mean, I, I'm married to a doctor, therefore I know loads of doctors. And actually knowing them and talking to them was the first awakening for me, that many people in really kind of involved professions, they work a lot of hours, it's very intense, they don't have as much time for all the amazing church activities that they would like to be part of. So they often feel they're less spiritual than all of you who make it to every house group, every Sunday service, do evangelism that's out with working hours, but they can't do that. And some of you sitting in here have very involved careers. You run businesses. That's a very, very demanding job. Or you might have another profession that's very demanding and you're struggling to tick all the boxes that, that you kind of perceive make you more Christian. Well, let's just turn that whole thing on its head. What if all your time spent out there in the workplace wasn't just to earn money? or to do a job, or to work, because that's what good Christians do. What if that was holy ground? What if that was you ticking your box in getting out there and releasing evangelism so that when you come home after a hard day at work, you're, when you're exhausted and then you've got your family and all your house stuff to take care of, you're not then trying to go right back out and do an extra evangelistic activity. Does that make sense? 
You might want to, you might want to go and sing carols. Listen, that's amazing. But you might not all have the time to do all of that. And then you feel less than. And that's my experience of talking to many professionals and many good, hardworking Christians. You know, if we switch that, we don't feel like if we don't make all those church activities that we're pulling from the church, we should be building the church up by when we make our workplaces, wherever that is for you, holy ground, with that enthusiasm, the testimonies, we bring that back into the family home. And we celebrate that and we bring power and strength back into the nucleus. This is the place of equipping. This is the place of refiring, the place that we get filled up and sent back out. What else was in the tabernacle of David? So David is this full spectrum leader and he demonstrates that. How do I know that he demonstrates that? Well, David, what happened at the beginning of the reign of David was that the backdrop was that the tabernacle of Moses had traveled all the way across Sinai. You know, the, the desert of Sinai, you know the story. It comes to the promised land and it rests at Gibeon for over 360 years. And through a sequence of events, the ark is captured by Israel's ark enemy, the Philistines. But the problem is wherever this box of holy dynamite goes, it starts blowing things up for the Philistines to the point that they're like, get this thing out of our land. You can have it back. Now, David does something utterly radical. And there's no way he didn't hear from God before he did this. There's just no way because I've studied the tabernacle pattern quite a bit now. The tabernacle pattern, the seven pieces of furniture that were part of Moses' tabernacle were a holy and a sacred divine pattern that was demonstrated upon the earth in a tangible form. It models for us a transformational journey deeper and deeper and deeper into relationship with God. Every piece of furniture, every one of the three areas has, is full of meaning and full of purpose. Now, in the third area, the, the deepest in area, it's called the Holy of Holies. And in the Holy of Holies, you all know this, you find the Ark of the Covenant. And the lid of the Ark of the Covenant is known as the mercy seat. There are two pieces of the furniture. And what they demonstrated for Israel was the very manifest presence of God upon the earth in that day. This is pre-Pentecost, remember. And so the Ark of the Covenant was critical for Israel. When it wasn't with them, they were in trouble. They knew it because it demonstrated to the other nations and the big scary enemies that the favor of God was with them. Now, David decides to not to return the Ark to the rest of the pattern, which is very daring and very pioneering. He decides to bring the ark to Jerusalem, which he has now established as his political capital. But he wants to also make it a worship center for the Lord. And the idea is that David has in his heart that instead of returning it to that very old dusty tent now, he wants to create for the Lord a permanent temple, a place of extraordinary beauty. Now, he brings the ark to Jerusalem as a stage one. And he houses the ark in a tent. And I always think this is hilarious, right? Have you ever seen pictures by illustrators of David's tent? Make kids' books are about the, the ones that do, do it the most. And honestly, it's like this some beautiful golden box and a little tent. Think camping. Think camping, the, the, the ark is going to camp in there for 40 years. It's all snuggy and cozy. Well, here's what the Bible says. There were 38,000 Levite priests running the house of God. 38,000. From that, 4,000 were chosen because they were musicians, Levite priests that would minister around the ark of God on a rota 24-7. From the 4,000, 280 were specifically chosen to be a core team to head this up. You get the picture. This is not a small gig. Now, David's the king and he loves God. Do you think that was a wee scabby bear tent? 
I don't think so. I think this was a beautiful, gorgeous, decorated tent. If you read the pattern of the tabernacle of Moses, we're talking the finest, most expensive materials you could find. Blue, purple, scarlet, the finest golds, the finest materials, gemstones. And what David does is he says to the Lord, Lord, I just wanna build a big temple for you. And the Lord says, you know, David, I really love your heart, but I'm actually, that is going to be the calling of your son, Solomon. You're going to get to do a piece, but this is for, the, for your son, Solomon, to build. But is David excluded from this hugely creative project? Absolutely not. It's David that is given the divine blueprints for the temple, just like Moses was for the tabernacle. Have you ever read the details of the Temple of Solomon? Absolutely mind blowing. I mean, this thing is like the tabernacle of Moses on steroids. Everything goes up to almost double. Some of the pieces of furniture increase from one to 10. The menorah, the golden lampstand, which, which demonstrates the seven spirits of God. The other thing that is increased is the table of showbread. So there's 10 of them. There's more gold. There are billions of American dollars spent then. And that is in today's money. Can you imagine what that cost back then? God didn't seem to have a problem with spending big bucks on decent art. I'm just saying. <laughs> in fact, he put a priority on it. He didn't think it was to jolly up a dull space that the Lord obviously thought by the demonstrations through the whole seven stages of the tabernacle pattern that actually this was key. And you want to know something amazing. When Moses was called to lead the children of Israel, he is called suddenly to lead millions of people. Theologians kind of estimate different theologians it's somewhere between two and four million, Right? That's still, a, that's a lot of people. They have a slave culture. It's not like they have their culture all ready and all shiny and they're all godly. This guy needs solutions. He needs strategies and he needs answers. And you know where the Lord tells Moses that he's going to give him all the strategies, says everything you are going to need to lead this nation, my nation, Moses, i.e. no pressure, but you better not get this wrong. And, he's, and the Lord says, I'm gonna give you a specific place where I'm gonna tell you political strategy, governmental strategy, leadership solutions and fresh vision and a whole range of ideas and innovations that you need to lead this, this people. And he says, I will meet you by the mercy seat, surrounded by the beauty and the artistry of the tabernacle. Now, if God was not interested in art and beauty, if it, if it carried no power, he would have chosen somewhere totally different. But he didn't. He said, it is there. I will meet you. And the mercy seat and the ark, the, the two cherubim that kind of touched wingtips, they covered the ark. They represented the type of angel that is called to guard the throne of God. So the, cher so the mercy seat represented the throne of God. And he said, it's, it's here. I will give you everything you need to know for strategy to lead, to beat for the commission I've given you. What would that look like for you? You've been called somewhere. Do you need strategy and solution? I know I do. Do we need fresh ideas and fresh vision for today? Absolutely. So, I'm going to run through real quick what's in the Davidic pattern. David also in the Psalms went before the ark of God because we know the famous Psalm 27, one thing, God, one thing I have desired is to, David was saying is to come into your presence, to come into your temple, to seek your, who can remember, your beauty, now, today, we think that just means the presence of God. But David was before the glorious golden box, surrounded by 
thousands of Levites releasing sound. So in the tabernacle of David, like put it like this. I brought a book. If this, if this, um, if you're thinking, what is she talking about? We have a few copies of Creative Fusion at the back, which was just published last year. And I have gone into all seven stages of the tabernacle pattern. What's within them and why it is critical for us today? What does that creative power of God looks like? What's our permission? Well, David seeks the Lord in a very similar place to Moses, pours out his heart before God and then asks him for constant solutions. When the ark of God finally makes it to Jerusalem, there is a massive ceremony. I mean like massive. Like David calls all the leaders of Israel. Everybody's gathered to honor the glorious ark of the Lord. It has returned to the nation of Israel and all is well. Do you remember the story of all the things David could have done publicly? It doesn't say he gave a big kingly speech. He might have done. It doesn't say that David played his harp because that's what he was really good at and sung some beautiful new song to the Lord. He might have done, but it doesn't say that. What did David do? He danced and he didn't just dance like, oh, I'm a king. He did a mental, vigorous, blow up type of dance. It said that David danced with all his might, all his might. It says that he stripped down to like his linen tunic. No king would ever do that. But he obviously felt a naked abandoned before God as a demonstration of his devotion to God. This was what he had to do. And if we think that dance is important today, maybe we should reread that passage in the Bible. Who do you think told David to dance? Have you ever thought about that? Because it wouldn't have been comfortable for David. And he certainly got the backlash, didn't he? Behind the scenes and probably publicly. And all his leaders could have gone, good Lord, this guy is a nutter and I am not following him anymore. Seriously, he seriously risked that though, didn't he? It's like, he's supposed to be a tough guy. You know, he's supposed to lead the army and be the king of Israel. And here he is prancing about in his tunic. But David thought, this is what I know I have to do. I got to model something different here. I've got to model something and movement was the only way it appears to have been done. Now, Davidic worship as it's known is a whole body, soul and spirit worship. And I saw some beautiful dancers starting here. And I'm saying to Katie, you know, there's a type of fabric we use back home that we just get masses of it. And it, it, forget, if you're not a dancer, just take that word out of your vocabulary because I know that can be awkward. I want you to think about movement. Think about moving in worship. Davidic worship, mo it modeled for us a whole body, soul, and spirit worship. Total devotion. The Old Testament into the New outlines features of Davidic worship. Now, some of them you're going to say, yeah, yeah, we do that. We do that. But lots of churches would give lip service to this, but not actually champion it, raise it up. There was speaking. There was shouting. There were singing new songs. I repeat, new songs, new songs, new songs as well as, obviously, the much-loved songs. You know what I love about Kelly and Drew? I've been with them the last two weekends because they were with me while I was teaching in Dallas. And they heard this. I know you heard this. I really felt to bring this teaching here as well. And what I love about them, listening to them worship in the class and this morning, is they can take a familiar, you know, like a, um, a chorus that you know and that you can catch hold of. But then they take it somewhere else and they're off wandering about the heavenlies and they're, they're, you can feel the presence of God increasing when that happens. This is Davidic worship. And when you have the courage to do that, we had a mini tabernacle here, a tabernacle gathering where we just take the lid off and explore the presence of God. And some of you were with us and something unusual happens. You've got to hold your nerve. You've got to explore and experiment. You've got to allow the science laboratory of the Lord and the freedom 
to explore like children his presence. But by the time we got to a certain point, that presence felt so hard, I could barely get off the floor. And when the presence of God hits you like that, you are being changed by the way. You're not just having a nice groovy little glowy moment with the Lord. You are being healed. You are being restored. We are being transformed. We are being rearranged. Our minds are being rearranged. And every time we hit that kind of presence, I never feel the same on the other side. There's more courage. There's more something. You need this for what you've got to do out there. All of these things I'm reading out, this Davidic worship is a I want you to see it like this. If God calls you to move color, forget thinking, oh, I'm a guy, I don't move fabric. This is color, move color. Color is important to God. Or if you feel to pick up your skills in creative writing or poetry, well, that is creative writing, sorry, Rob, creative writing of all types. If you feel to dust off the crafts that you love to do or the painting or whatever, you may not be called to make that your profession. And that doesn't matter because all of these are doorways into the divine realm. You've got to stop thinking, well, I don't dance, I don't move. And this is exactly what we're all like in Britain, so I'll speak for our British people. Frank has broken through. Did you see him this morning? He is, a, and he'll model freedom. The Lord will say to us who are leading this, Model what freedom looks like. I can't tell you to break through and like at the tabernacle last night, just stand there going, well, you break through, you break through. <laughs> Leaders, we have to model this. We have to model what this looks like, fully engaged. In the tabernacle of David, musicians were playing and prophesying with instruments, not just words. Let your musicians learn to prophesy, to prophesy a sound when you feel that the Lord has a sound to release. You don't have to do everything all at once. We must steward the spirit of God with sensitivity. Host the presence. Get out of the way when the Holy Spirit wants to do something. Step up when the Lord is asking us to step up. In the tabernacle of David, there was dancing and there was movement. There was standing. There was bowing. There was lifting and clapping hands. There was thanksgiving. There were sacrifices of praise. And the tabernacle and the temple were epicenters of worship. And from them, there was a tremendous ripple effect. And I'm going to talk about that in the next message, the next service. There was a ripple effect across all the other areas of culture, but it began in the epicenter. And the epicenter of worship was not a wee bare tent. It was the divine temple of Solomon. It was absolutely saturated with excellent design, architecture, craftsmanship, artistry of all types. It was saturated with new songs. It was saturated with not just songs, but just sounds, just sound being released at times. We don't always need a song. Sometimes we need a breaker sound. Sometimes we need a sound that releases healing and nobody's going to touch you or pray for you, but the sound will release your healing. And we have seen the evidence of this now for years. So just to land this plane, let's unleash the value of the full spectrum of God's communication, his language. This is the language of God. This is not me making it up because I quite like art. God demonstrated in his word through leader after leader that the creative power of God is your breakthrough power. What about Joshua to take Jericho? Was that a sensible, straightforward strategy? That was absolutely bonkers. Just walk around the city, singing songs, blowing trumpets, and guess what? Massive, impenetrable stronghold walls will just crumble before you. What a great metaphor for today. What is your doorway to access the divine, to bring down the strongholds and walls to the area that God has called you to in culture? 
because it might be that you need to pick up a trumpet and just blow it at home. It might be that your doorway to the divine is to actually try and draw. Who cares if it's beautiful? I have seen people literally feel, I'm going to take a red pen and scribble on a piece of paper with courage. I know like people are looking and thinking this isn't real art. That's not the point. And, I, and then they burst into tears and they had a massive healing from God. Just a red crayon. Just the courage to say, okay, I'm not an artist, but I know God is telling me to move, to respond, to do something different, to do something uncomfortable sometimes like David did when he danced. So I'm just going to pray for you. And I believe at the back, um, we've, got, we've got another service, haven't we, happening at 11.15. But we do, I do have some um, spirit-inspired art at the back. I've got a wee bit left. This is my last stop on the road before I go home. And if the book Creative Fusion, if you want to know more about this message, there's a lot more in the book. So Father God, I ask you to come now and reveal to everyone in this room the divine doorways. I ask you to give us the courage to open them up. I ask you to help us to see the value of the full spectrum of your creative character and the power that every element of it holds. I ask you, Lord, to help us to start to value each other's commissions and callings with equal value, to call each other higher, to cheer each other on, to see our workplaces as holy ground because we bring your spirit into that arena. And we can change things so that the people around us will turn their face towards you and begin to ask the questions, begin to feel there's something missing. Lord, I feel to just release the pioneers in this room. There are pioneers in this room and you just feel like you're either held back or you don't understand your calling. But we desperately need the pioneers and the early adopters to rise up in the church in this day. So I bless you to rise up, to find out what it means to pioneer. Lord, I feel that you so want to bless the pioneering leadership of this church. Father, I ask you to come and blow the breath of God upon all of them, Father. They have been pushing through. They've been pioneering. They've been butting heads with the enemy who doesn't like pioneers. But Lord, I see you sweep the enemy out of the way with a move of your hand that over the season of Christmas, you are going to bring them refreshing and blessing and new courage and new confidence and new vision. And I would challenge you as their, the body around this leadership to pray for them. Over Christmas, I feel like the Lord is, is challenging you. Would you pray for them? Would you speak strength over your leadership with the power of the spoken word over Jeffrey and Amanda over their family and all the key leaders in this church because 2023 is going to be a really pivotal year for this church I keep seeing you guys breaking through much more in what you're pressing into with a lot less opposition it doesn't mean no opposition it will come at you but I see the Lord sweeping it aside with a lot more like like faster and with more ease. You'll feel it pull out of your way. It will be the year for the pioneers in this church to rise up. And you're gonna have to get some equipping and training. So find out where you need to go to do that. Start to ask the Lord. This is an equipping center. I was asked um, just real quick, Jeffrey, Cameron said, what was that vision you brought for Tabernacle? And I remembered it. I saw the cloud of the Lord. I saw a massive pillar of light and cloud come right through the ceiling when I was here at Tabernacle. And I heard the Lord say, this place will be raised up to be an equipping center that doesn't compromise on the presence and the power of the Lord because you don't really care if it will cost you everything because not everybody wants to be part of a vision like that. And if you don't want to be part of a vision like that, the next year will be tricky for you. But I see fresh people coming in to your ranks as well. I see pioneers and I see prophets. 
But I don't see the kind of prophets that are looking for a pushy stage. I see them come in humbly. I see them come to serve because prophets should raise up other people first before they build their own platform. So I see real equippers, real humble equipping hearts coming in and they'll come in with the sleeves rolled up going, how can I help you? This place is awesome and God has sent me here. So I'll leave it there, but bless you guys and thank you for receiving us. Thank you so much for what you brought and your, what you shared. I hope that it's, I, I believe it is an empowering word. And I just want to challenge our, our church. Do you believe that the spirit of God lives in you? Because yes. that's key to this message. Yes. If you don't believe what the word says, that the spirit of God is in you, then this message will fall on empty ears. And what the Lord wants to do is he wants to just open up for an impartation. And he, he, run, he wants to meet you where you're at. So if you're like, man, I don't believe that the Spirit of God is in me. Some of you might be like Gideon and you're in a wine press and you're hiding and you're scared and a little piddle down your leg and you're just terrified. <laughs> but what the Lord would say is that you're a mighty man or a mighty woman of valor. I've put my spirit in you. I'm going to qualify you because I'm calling you. You're not qualified and then I call you. I'm going to bring everything that you need. So if you'd, uh, before we go into that, I just have one administrative thing that I'd like to announce is uh, Steve Hardy's memorial is this Saturday, the 17th at 11 a.m. And we want to invite our church to come and celebrate his life. And uh, we do have a way that you can physically participate. Uh, you can uh, sign up to bring a meal. We're going to feed everyone afterwards. The family wants to invite you to a food celebration. And we get to be a part of the living bread by bringing bread or pork or <laughs> cake or cake or cake. Just kidding. I'm a pie guy. So you can see Miss Sherry at the connection booth and she'll, she can get you signed up on what dish to bring. Or she's back there right by the tree and she can bring, uh, you can see her for what dish to bring. If you stand with me, I'm going to invite our ministry team to come forward at this time. They're here to pray for you and with you uh, to take your next step this morning. If you're one of those who are like, I don't believe, I don't think the Spirit of God is in me, I'm going to invite you to find someone up front and receive a baptism of the Holy Spirit or to begin your relationship with Jesus. If you're like, I, I just doubt that the Spirit of God is in me, I just want you to be reconciled with what the Word says through the laying on of hands of the people in this church. If you don't believe that, if you don't feel power and equipped to do the things that the message brought, then come up forward and receive prayer that the Spirit of God would be in you. You would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So, dear my Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the release of strategy and creativity and beauty and art and design and everything. I pray that the person, the design that you put together in their mother's womb would come forth. Father, I ask that you would solidify the destiny and the design and the way that you've put in each person in this room. I pray that the Holy Spirit would breathe on them, would rest in them. I feel that, the, I ask that they would begin to feel your power, begin to turn their insides, that if they don't do something, if they don't move, if they don't obey, if they don't create, if they're not a part of the, an ember spark that will bring on the revival fire that's coming, that you would stir the people to participate in what you're bringing. Lord, thank you. I thank you that you are the gate, that you are the door. I thank you that with everything that was brought, we'll encounter you in every spectrum of expression. Bless Charity and Streams Creative House and all of her leadership and her travel 
I pray that she would have a double portion of everything she poured out on this last trip. I pray that the blessings that she, that we have, she would partake in those blessings as well. I pray that you would pour out more light and more oil on her and through her. I pray that, I thank you, Lord, that there is a releasing happening in her hands. That there, there's a releasing happening in your hands, Charity, that the Lord is bringing forth. He's bringing out of you that a deep well of impartation. It's almost it's funny. The Lord is funny. It's like Santa Claus in the, the Chronicles of Narnia. You'll have gifts at the appropriate time. And the gifts that you have are going to speak to how God designed them. And he's going to partner you to be a bridge to awaken people's destinies through impartation. Lord, thank you for moving. Lord, we love you so much. We give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' mighty name. I just feel like the Lord is saying, man, I was going to say amen. I landed the plane and then took right off again. There's someone in this room that you've been contemplating suicide. And the Lord says this morning that you are valuable, that you have so much more life to live. And what the Lord wants to do right now through his spirit is he wants to break the noose that you've put around your neck already. You've been thinking about taking your life. And I'm here to tell you that we need to break this yoke of death that's over you. You have so much more life to live. You are valuable. You are loved. You are seen. If that's you, I don't know who it is. I don't have any clue who it is. But I just pray right now that the spirit of death, that assignment of death would be broken right now in the name of Jesus that life and life abundantly would flow over you, that you would know that you are seen, that you are loved, that you are valuable, that you are cared for, that you're in his arms and you have purpose. You have purpose, you have purpose, you have purpose. In the name of Jesus, we pray that you would release that life. The spirit of life would visit that person right now and that noose would be broken that's around their neck. Lord, we love you. That was a good amen. That was a good not finish, right? We love you, Lord. Thank you so much for all that you're doing. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. We love you. Merry Christmas.